All right, so it's a pleasure to have CC Shen from Northwestern, and she will talk about metrics of constant churn scalar curvature and the associated Calabi flow. Go ahead. Perfect, thank you, Tamash. Okay, so today we talk about metrics of constant churn scalar curvature um, and a churn Calabi flow. So let's begin. So firstly, I'm gonna outline my talk. We're gonna start by discussing some background and setup. And then from there, we'll move into problems in the Kähler setting, where we'll, I'll give some examples of constant scalar curvature Kähler metrics. That's what CSCK stands for. Um, and then we'll discuss the existence problem for CSCK metrics. And from there, we're going to discuss how all this theory in the Kähler setting can be generalized to the non kähler setting. And so here's where we'll talk about estimates for metrics of constant churn scalar curvature. Um, we'll discuss um, a churn Calabi flow for Hermitian metrics and then we'll outline the proof of the, es of the estimates. Okay, so here's just some set setup. So we're gonna let X omega be a compact complex manifold of complex dimension N and omega a Hermitian metric on X. And so we can define our local coordinates Z1 through Zn on X and locally our, what do I, well, I will refer to as a metric omega is in fact this one one form given in this way where Gij is a positive definite Hermitian matrix. And we see that this one one form omega is Kähler if and only if it's closed. Um, that is D of omega vanishes. And so throughout this talk, I'll start off with the case where everything is Kähler and then the latter half of the talk, everything will be uh, in the context of non-Kähler. Okay, so let's discuss notions of curvature. So the Chern-Ricci form is a one one form given by negative dd bar log determinant of g. And so similarly, the first churn class is the Dobo or dd bar class of this Ricci form. And the churn scalar curvature, which I'll denote by just capital R of a given metric omega is just the trace of the churn Ricci curvature for the churn Ricci form. I'll keep referring to these things synonymously. And so in the Kähler setting, the churn and the levy chivita connections agree and so the churn Ricci and churn scalar curvature are equal to the standard Ricci and scalar curvature. So in the Kähler setting, you have nice symmetries in the indices of the curvature tensor. And so no matter how you trace that up, you always end up with the standard scalar curvature. But in the non kähler setting, you don't have these symmetries. And so in fact, there exists four different possible Ricci curvatures and two possible scalar curvatures. And so I'm specifically gonna focus on the case where we trace it a certain way. Um, Okay, so let's discuss the Calabi functional. So the Calabi functional is introduced by Calabi and it's defined as the square of the L2 norm of the scalar curvature. And so you can rewrite this integral here as the L2, the square of the L2 norm of the difference of the scalar curvature and the average scalar curvature. So underline R denotes the average scalar curvature um, with addition of this L2 norm of this average scalar curvature. And so this is in the Kähler setting. So in the Kähler setting, this average scalar curvature quantity is in fact invariant of the Kähler class of omega. So as you can see, it, it's an invariant, it's a homo, cohomological invariant. Um, and so just giving you some definitions here, extremal metrics were introduced by Calabi and they're defined as critical points of the Calabi functional and constant scalar curvature metrics are a subset of extremal metrics where they satisfy that the scalar curvature is equal to the average scalar curvature everywhere. And from the above equation, you can see that these in fact minimize the Calabi functional. Since this part is an invariant of your class, you cannot change. This is always me a square, thus positive quantity. It's minimized when this thing vanishes, which is exactly when the metric is CSEK. Okay, so let's discuss the Calabi flow. So given X omega naught, a compact Kähler manifold, the Clavi flow um, starting at this metric omega naught is defined by this evolution where you evolve omega, this evolving metric omega of T in the time direction by DD bar of the scalar curvature of this evolving metric, also dependent on T where you start from this initial metric. Um, and you can see that this doesn't change the Kähler class or DD bar class of the metric. And so you can in fact write the evolution in terms of this Kähler potential. So you can write the evolving metric omega T starting at omega naught and then evolving by DD bar of this Kähler potential for some smooth Kähler potential, which we will call phi 
Um, and you can normalize phi so that it's unique. So in this case, I, this is a standard way of choosing it. And in normalizing it this way, then the Clabby flow can be written in terms of evolving phi of t by the scalar curvature of the evolving metric minus r of r. So this is just some constant, which was determined by the fact that we normalized in this way. And you again can just set the initial function to be zero. And so this clabby, this flow here, the clabby flow is in fact a gradient flow for both the clabby functional as well as the Bucci K energy functional. Um, and fixed points are constant scalar curvature Kähler metrics. As you can see here, if this vanishes, then you have a CSDK metric. Okay, so convergence of the clabby flow. So there are known results about the clabby flow. So Chen He proved short-term existence of the Clabby flow and global existence of a flow under the assumption of a uniform Ricci bound. And Zekle Hidi proved that uniformly bounded curvature along the flow and proper Mabuchi energy uh, gives that the flow converges to a CSCK metric. And Chen Sun proved that if the initial metric is sufficiently close to a CSCK metric in some sense that I, I'm not di diving into, then the flow exists and converges uniformly to the CSCK metric. Okay, so now let's discuss examples of CSCK metrics. So in general, in complex geometry, or it's a, the existence of these canonical metrics within a given killer class are of large interest. And so CSCK metrics, extremal metrics, and killer Einstein metrics can, you know, people can consider them as potential candidates as, for like a canonical metric within a given class. So firstly, killer Einstein metrics are a subset or are themselves constant scalar curvature metrics. And they're those defined um, to satisfy that the Ricci of the metric omega is equal to a scalar multiple of the metric itself. So Ricci omega equals lambda omega. And then up to rescaling, since the left-hand side here doesn't change up to rescaling, lambda you can assume is either negative one, zero, or positive one. And so examples of these, in the case where lambda is positive one, we have the classical example of the Fubini studi metric on complex projected space. For lambda equals zero, this is the whole class of clabby yam metrics. Uh, for example, the flat metric on CN or on the torus. And then hyperbolic metrics on Riemann surfaces of units greater than equal to two are examples of the case where lambda is negative. And so loosely speaking, if you have a killer Einstein metric, then that is also gonna be a CSDK metric. And those, since those are critical points or minimizers of the clabby functional, those are also gonna be critical points. And so they are also themselves extremal metrics. And so explicit constructions of CSCK and extremal metrics has been done by Kalabi, Huang, Guan, Tonison Friedman, and Huang Singer. Okay, so now we'll dive into the problem of the existence of killer Einstein metrics on a complex manifold, complex compact killer manifold. So if you have a killer Einstein manifold that is one that permits a killer Einstein metric, then that means that the first turn class of the manifold, which is defined as this DD bar class of the Ricci curvature is going to be equal to lambda omega in these three, these three cases of the different signs of lambda. And so it was shown that the existence of a killer Einstein metric is equivalent to finding a solution phi to the complex Mangin-Pair equation given by omega plus DD bar phi to the n equaling e to the lambda phi plus f omega to the n, where f is the Ricci potential of omega. And so we have three different cases for the lambda. So in the case where lambda is negative or where other when the first turn class is negative, the existence of a killer Einstein metric, omega belonging to negative of the first turn class. So omega is always a positive form. In this case, the first turn class is negative. So now we're requiring that the metric belong to negative of this negative uh, first turn class was proved independently by Yao and Oban in 78. And for the clabby yau case, that is the case where the first turn class, van class vanishes, um, the existence of a Ricci flat killer Einstein metric omega, it was shown that you can find one in any given killer class. And this was a result that was proved by Yao. So in the negative first turn class case, you can always, the statement is finding one within the negative of the first turn class. For the vanishing case, you can find one in any given killer class. So it's a bit broader of a statement. And then, now we'll talk about the Yao Tian Donaldson conjecture for killer Einstein metrics. So the, more, the most difficult of the three cases is, is when lambda is positive. And these are the Fano 
the Fano manifold. And so for Fano manifolds, the Yao Tian Donaldson conjecture states that, um, asserts that yeah, the existence of killer Einstein metrics is equivalent to this algebraic notion of K stability. Um, and the forward direction was established by Chen Donaldson's son, building on the work of Tian Yao and Tian in the case of Fano surfaces. And the result, sorry, the reverse direction was shown by Tian Donaldson Stopa and in the most general form by Berman. Okay, so that was the Yao Tian Donaldson conjecture for Kähler Einstein metrics in the Fano case. There's also a conjecture now for the case of constant scalar curvature metrics. And so more generally, the, the Yao Tian Donaldson conjecture conjectures that the existence of a CSCK metric in a given Kähler class is equivalent to a relative notion of case stability. So in the Kähler Einstein case, it was relative to the first Turing class, but here it's relative to any given Kähler class. So it's a different, it's a slightly adjusted notion of case stability. And it is known that the existence of CSEK implies case stability as shown by Stopa and Berman. Um, and the converse remains open. And the difficulty, the main difficulty with the CSEK case is that from a partial differential equations point of view, it's a fourth order PDE versus in the killer einstein case, it's a second order PDE. So those two additional orders uh, implies that the problem is a little bit more difficult to work with. And then Chen Chang in 2017 made progress towards showing existence of CSEK metric within a given killer class. Okay, so before we go more into existence, I'm gonna discuss uh, an obstruction to existence of a constant scalar curvature killer metric. So if, again, underline R denotes the average scalar curvature of omega on the manifold X. And so it follows that by definition that if you integrate R minus the average scalar curvature, it's gonna to go to zero. And so by the existence of a solution to the Poisson equation, you can always find this potential H such that the Laplacian of this H is equal to R minus underline R. And so in Shembai Futaki that there is this, he introduces an invariant for the killer class um, where given a holomorphic vector field V that, can, that takes on this form, so V super I, uh, can be written as g i j bar of partial j bar of f for this potential function f. Um, then the Futaki invariant for this vector field is defined as negative of the integral of this vector field acting on this potential function up here h uh, integrated against omega to the n. And so via an integration by parts, which works out straightforwardly in the Kähler case, this in this integral indeed equals the integral of r minus r underline r uh, multiplied against f times omega to the n. And so it can be shown that this is invariant of the Kähler class. So up to the addition of dd bar v of a smooth function, this, this won't change. And so you can see that if there exists a CSCK metric in a class, then this right-hand side will vanish. And since it's invariant, it will vanish for any f because you know this, this r minus underline r part is vanishing. And so this gives us an, instruction, an, an obstruction if you do happen to find some v such that f of v does not vanish because that would imp Apply that there cannot exist a CSEK metric inside the Kähler class. Okay. And let me know if I'm going too fast. Okay, so now I'll move into talking about a continuity path for CSEK. So a continuity path was also the approach that Alban and Yao used in the Kähler Einstein case. Here we consider a different path, of course, because this is a different problem uh, that Chen proposed in 2015. So for some real number t between in the closed interval zero one, we define this equation um, here, which we refer to as star sub t. And so just looking at this, you can see that when t equals zero, the equation at hand is simply equating this trace sub omega phi of omega to a constant term. And at t equals one, this part vanishes. So you're your equation at t equals one is simply that r of this resultant omega phi is equal to this c. Thus, this resultant thing at t equals one is constant scalar curvature. And so, I mean, our goal is to show existence of constant scalar curvature. So what this path is doing is like trying to continually, just like, you know, extend a solution from t equals zero to a solution at t equals one. And so in order to do that, we define i to be the interval uh, for all t in this closed interval zero one, where equation star sub t has a solution. And so to show existence of such a metric, uh, 
we need to show, or one way of doing it would be to show that I is firstly non-empty. And this is true because at t equals zero, you just have this trace term. And so simply choosing phi to be zero or any constant rather will, will give you a solution at t equals zero. Um, and then you just show that this interval i is open. And so Chen in the same paper where he proposed this path proved openness um, away from zero. So for all, for the open interval zero to the closed interval one. Um, and this was because um, at t equals zero, the, the situation at hand is a little bit trickier because this is a second order and this is a fourth order. So this jump in regularity or order is, makes it a little bit tricky given what he was trying to do. Um, but later that year and earlier next, the next year, Hashimoto and Zhang used approximation methods to prove openness specifically for the case t equals zero, openness at t equals zero. Um, and then finally, and most recently, uh, Chen Chang in 2017 were able to show that this interval i is in fact closed, uh, but only under the condition where the, of bounded entropy uh, along the path, where the entropy quantity is defined as the integral of the log of this ratio of volume forms integrated against omega phi to the n. Yeah, so um, it just means that, you know, can't always, there can't always exist a CSEK metric um, or yeah, and so they require this bounded entropy to actually show existence. Okay, so how did they show existence? So the CSE equa equa CSEK equation for omega phi, so you're looking for a CSEK metric omega phi uh, differing from omega by addition of dd bar of a space function phi. And so, like I mentioned earlier, it's gonna be a fourth order equation. But the trick that Chen Chang used was that they broke it down into a pair of second order equations. Um, so they first defined, the first equation is just defining this variable f to be the log of this ratio of volume forms. And then the second equation um, is taking the Laplacian of this f. And then in here, you technically will get a trace omega phi of Ricci omega phi plus trace omega phi of Ricci omega. And they're imposing the constant scalar curvature condition by equating this part to underline r or rather the average scalar curvature of omega phi. And so Chen Chang proved closeness under the assumption of bound entropy, like I mentioned earlier, and the main, the key ingredient was showing the following a priori estimate. And so their exact statement of their theorem is that if you have X omega phi, a CSEK metric, where omega phi equals omega plus dd bar of the smooth function phi, then all derivatives and the sup norm of the killer potential phi can be estimated in terms of an upper bound of the entropy. So the bound will depend on X, the, the background metric omega and the entropy. Okay. And so Chen Cheng used their estimates to prove in 2018 in a subsequent series of papers, there were three in total, that properness of KNRG and Ramabuchi's KNRG in terms of the L1 geodesic distance in the space of killer potentials, modulo the automorphism group, um, implies the existence of a CSCK metric. And this builds on theory developed by Darvash and Rubinstein, uh, where they where the problem reduces to regularity of minimizers of the K energy. And the reverse direction was established by Berman, Darvash, and Liu in 2016. Okay, so that's the theory for the killer stuff. Now we get to a point where um, the question at hand is from this, like, how can we extend this theory of existence to the non killer? permission setting. So I'm still maintaining that it's, we're still working with permission manifolds. We're just loosening the fact that omega no longer has to be closed. Okay, so let's first just talk about metrics of constant churn scalar curvature. So like I mentioned earlier, there are two different ways you can trace the curvature tensor to get a scalar curvature. Um, and the way that we'll consider is the churn scalar curvature. And that's the one where you're tracing over the churn Ricci form. And we choose this one because and using this one, the churn Ricci form is given by an equation that looks like the complex monotone pair equation. Versus if you chose the other one, um, then it differs from the killer case in a lot more ways. And so firstly, the churn Yamabe problem of existence of a constant churn scalar curvature metric uh, within a given permission conformal class was investigated by Angelis, Kalamai, and Spotty in 2017. And they show existence in the case where the expected constant churn scalar curvature is non-positive. So they prove existence within a given permission conformal class. Um, 
And then COCA and Ledgeme in 2019 uh, explicitly constructed, constructed solutions or constructed, sorry, CS, CCSC metrics on rolled surfaces. So that, for example, they worked on here's a brook surfaces that are known to not permit, admit any uh, CSC K metrics. So no constant scalar curvature Kähler metrics, but they're able to construct still constant churn scalar curvature metrics. that are non Kähler. Okay. So now we'll talk about how uh, the results of Chen Chang can be extended to the non killer setting. So firstly, in the killer case, you have the Dobo cohomology class to work with. And so you're, the question of existence is asking when there exists this omega phi CSEK within the killer class of omega. And in our case, in the non killer setting, we don't have the metric is closed, so we cannot define this cohomology class. So we'll simply ask, you know, when does there exist a constant churn scalar curvature metric differing from some given permission metric up to addition of DD bar of a smooth function phi. So that the theory still feels pretty similar without requiring closeness. And then, like I mentioned earlier, going from the standard scalar curvature, specifically now choosing, honing, on, honing in on the churn scalar curvature, because that one most closely resembles the one in the killer case, at least in the set of computations. And so the question we like to ask is, if we have X omega, which is a compact complex manifold, under what conditions does there exist a constant churn scalar curvature metric of the form omega phi equaling omega plus dd bar phi for a smooth function phi? And so we proved the estimates in the same way as Chen Cheng under the assumption of bounded entropy. So the entropy is defined exactly the same way as in the Kähler case. Um, and since we've loosened the Kähler assumption, we still have to supplement by making this slightly weaker assumption that dd bar omega to the k vanishes for k equals one and two, uh, which we'll later see in fact means it vanishes for all k. And this three notable things that this assumption provides us with is that it ensures that the volume is preserved in this dd bar class of omega in the sense that if you add dd bar phi to this omega, its integral of its volume form stays the same. And that's that just makes many parts of the comp uh, computation more simplified. Another part is that it, in, in a similar fashion, it means that the average scalar curvature is an invariant of the DD bar class. So this average scalar curvature of metric omega is still gonna equal the average scalar curvature of metric omega phi under this assumption. Um, because otherwise, and we'd have another situation where there'd be time dependence on this, this what would, would have been a constant that was independent of time. And then finally, this condition, or specifically just the go to Sean condition, which is that dd bar omega to the n minus one vanishes, uh, gives us that integrals of Laplacians of smooth functions vanish. And that's also just a component of the proof that arises several times and needs to be dealt with. Okay, so let's dive into the assumption a little bit further. So like I said earlier, uh, I write it as dd bar omega to the k vanishing for k equals one and two, but in fact, this is equivalent to it vanishing for all k most interestingly, k from one to n minus one, um, because by straightforward computation, dd bar omega k can be expanded into this term where you have dd bar omega, wedge some power of omega, and then this other term where you have d omega wedge d bar omega. But these purple terms still vanish using our assumptions because this term vanishes by the assumption where k equals two. Um, and then when you expand that out, this part vanishes by the assumption where k equals one, and so that gives us that this thing, in fact, also vanishes. So this always vanishes too for all k. So those are actually equivalent statements. Um, and so this might seem like a strong condition. So you might ask when such a metric exists, or do, do they ever even exist outside of the Kähler setting? Because of course, Kähler metrics satisfy this property. Um, and so they do, in fact, exist in some elementary examples. So for example, if you let x be a product metric, sorry, product manifold, where you cross n a complex surface and m a Kähler manifold of any dimension you'd like, um, then on the complex surface at n, you can always find a Godeschon metric. And so a Godeschon metric will satisfy this condition uh, because you're working in the case where it's just a, you know, n equals two, where it's just a complex surface. And so omega n satisfies this condition. And then when you cross it against this Kähler metric, you can obviously choose the Kähler, sorry, when you cross it with the Kähler manifold, you can always choose this Kähler metric omega m, which will also satisfy this. And thus the resultant product metric where maybe I should have put like projection, but basically this product metric satisfies 
the condition we are talking about. And so this, this, metr this manifold X is certainly non kähler because you're crossing it with this non kähler component. So it is definitely extending it beyond just the realm of kähler manifolds. Um, this is the most elementary example I could think of. Okay, so now let's discuss estimates for constant churn scalar curvature metrics. So we prove the following a priori estimates, similar to the Chen Chang result. So we're gonna let X omega be a compact complex manifold with omega Hermitian metric satisfying our assumption. Um, and so if omega phi equaling omega plus dd bar phi is a metric of constant churn scalar curvature, then for all K, we have that the CK norm of phi is bounded by a constant depending on K, X, omega, and the entropy. So ENT denotes the entropy of omega and omega phi. So this is analogous to the Kähler setting where we just have to make this additional assumption or rather we've swapped out the Kähler assumption to the slightly weakened form. And so this is the CSC case, so the constant scale curvature case, but more recently these estimates in fact very straightforwardly um, extend to the non-constant scalar curvature case where you can still get CK bounds on phi for all K, um, just that now the right-hand side constant will also depend on the C0 norm of R phi. So it doesn't have to be constant anymore. If it were constant, you obviously don't have this dependence, which is what we have above. But if you wanted to keep it around and not assume it was constant, um, then the, the estimates still work out. You just have this additional assumption. And so this latter, set of estimates was useful uh, recently for showing results about this analog of a Calabi flow in the Hermitian setting. So before we dive into that, I'm gonna talk about the Mubuchi K energy on Hermitian manifolds. So we're gonna work with X omega naught, a compact Hermitian manifold with vanishing first spot Turing class. Uh, so this is a slightly more refined version of the standard Turing class, um, first Turing class. And so, in this case, it coincides with where, when, when the average scalar curvature R is zero. And so Tosati Weinkov observed that the Mabuchi energy can be defined in this way. So this is, normally you see the Mabuchi energy defined in a variational uh, point of view, but here, if you integrate it by, out by parts, you can see that you can write it in this form. Um, where this form I've written here explicitly uses the fact that we're working within the vanishing uh, first spot churn class case. And this F is the churn reaching potential of omega naught, which is just the one, you know, because you're working in the vanishing first churn class case, you know that the Ricci form of this is going to be dd bar of some function F. So we refer to this F as a churn Ricci potential. And V here is just the integral of your initial metric volume form, which indeed still stays preserved under the flow, since the flow, uh, yeah, moves along the dd bar class of the metric. And so if omega naught is Kähler, then this agrees with the standard Mabuchi energy in the Kähler setting. Um, and critical points are churn Ricci flat metrics. So typically the Mabuchi energy's critical points are constant scalar curvature metrics. But in the case where you restrict to vanishing first churn class, their critical point, like all, the only constant scalar curvature metrics on manifold with vanishing first churn class are gonna be churn Ricci flat. Uh, by, by a straightforward computation. Just, just perhaps one quick question, if you can go back. So, mm -hmm. uh, what happens or what goes wrong if 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 something indeed does go wrong? In case uh, you don't have that C one B C X equals zero. So you can see here that uh, so the original if you if you compute the non variational equation for the Mooch energy. It gives you the entropy quantity integrated over T, and then it gives, or sorry, without the T, um, because you're taking it. Then, but you still have to add to it um, a sum of like Ricci wedge omega to some K wedge omega phi to like N minus K minus one or something a bunch of times over. And so, in the case where you don't have vanishing first string class, then that sum doesn't reduce nicely because when you take the Ricci potential, so here the Ricci potential itself is simply dd bar F. But in the case of, if you assume, so firstly, if you assume positive first spot turn class or negative first spot turn class, then you immediately are again in the killer setting, right? Because imposing that condition gives you killerness. Um, so if you don't impose that condition, then, then you just have to, then you can write in terms of the Ricci without expanding it further. And so you can't, you can't jump into this sort of formulation. 
I see. Right, because you, you can't break down the Ricci anymore. Yeah, so that's right. the main problem there. Okay, so now we'll discuss a churn clabby flow on Hermitian manifolds. So here, in the same way as the clabby flow, we can evolve, the flow can evolve this function phi of t. Um, and so you can write the flow starting at omega naught uh, by the evolution in terms of this potential function phi of t. And so this analog is given by the evolution that phi of t evolves in t by the scalar curvature of t plus this giant term involving torsion. So torsion is something that measures the inability of a metric to be Taylor. So in the Taylor setting, torsion always vanishes. Uh, so, and then since you know that the average scalar curvature is zero, this agrees with the standard Clabby flow if the initial metric is Taylor. Uh, but since it's not, then we have this non-zero term that's also here with us. Um, but the integral of this whole thing will still vanish. And again, F is a Trinricci potential, and this specific term is the trace of the torsion. So if you're interested, you know, the torsion of the evolving metric where it's Ti sub i against the thing that I'm interproducting together with this latter term. And so, like I mentioned, if omega naught is Kähler, then this agrees with the standard Calabi flow since this vanishes and you have an implicit negative R underline R here. Um, and this flow was derived basically as the gradient flow of the Mbuch energy. So the Mbuch energy will vanish along this flow. Uh, in the case where we have a definition from Mbuch energy, which is why we work within the realm of permission manifold with vanishing first spot Turing class. It would be nice to know how to extend this more generally. But like I said earlier, the, the definition of the Mbuch energy cannot be written in as nice a fashion when you don't assume signedness of the first Turing class. And you can also see from this that, well, it's not super immediate because you have this giant tor trailing torsion term, but in fact, fixed points of this uh, flow are constant turn scalar curvature metrics, which again, because we're working the context of vanishing first flat turn class, coincide with the, those metrics that are turn Ricci flat. So fixed points of this flow are turn Ricci flat metrics. Okay, and so in this setting, we can use the estimates we showed previously to conclude convergence properties of the flow. So again, if we let X omega naught be a compact Hermitian manifold of vanishing first spot Turing class, you impose the assumption, this assumption that I've been talking about this whole time on the initial metric omega naught. Then we can conclude that a solution to the churn clabby flow starting at omega naught exists as long as a churn scalar curvature remains, ba remains bounded along the flow. So those estimates we have on phi have a dependence that constant depends on R of phi, like I showed earlier, if you guys remember. And so we can only conclude existence of this flow for as long as that constant stays bounded. So we need to assume that the churn scalar curvature still remains bounded along the flow, um, which is similar to the results in the Kähler setting. And in addition, if the churn scalar curvature remains uniformly bounded for all time, then we can show that we have smooth convergence of the flow to the unique churn Ricci flat metric um, in, in the DD bar class of omega naught. So it's gonna be of the form omega infinity equaling omega naught plus DD bar, this potential function limited to infinity. And so this is, this is an application of the estimates that I discussed previously. And it's kind of like a, and it introduces a method of approaching the existence problem of constant turn scalar curvature metrics using a, a parabolic flow. Um, obviously, the conclusion here is not particularly unique or interesting, but it's like a it's a it's the method that shows that the fact that it still works is kind of interesting. And hopefully, if this can be extended, then it might give, provide more meaningful results about the existence of more general constant scalar curvature metrics. Okay, so the estimates in this in the constant scale curvature case and in the non constant scale curvature case uh, follow in a, a very similar fashion. So I was going to quickly go through the method used to compute the, the, the estimates in the constant scale curvature case. So again, we use this the, the pair of second order coupled equations, uh, look, which looks exactly the same as in the Kähler setting, um, where in this case, 
the Laplacian Ricci form denote the turn Laplacian and the turn Ricci curvature. Um, and so the approach to showing these estimates follows from that of Chen Chang, where they first prove a C0 estimate for F and phi, then they prove a C1 estimate on, on phi, followed by an LP estimate on the trace of omega of omega phi, which with right hand side constants still depending on P. And then from there, they compute further and use a Moser duration argument to remove dependence and in fact, get this L infinity bound on this trace. Um, where the constants on the right-hand side, so the constant on the right-hand side here will depend on the entropy. And so that gets passed along uh, throughout. So the final constants will depend on X omega and the entropy. And so why is that sufficient? Well, once you show an L infinity bound on this trace, then it's very straightforward if you have a bound on their volume forms, which you do because this is basically e to the f or e to the ne negative f in this case, uh, that you can get, obtain the trace bound the other way, so the other trace. And then once you have those two trace bounds, there's a straightforward bootstrapping argument that you can use uh, involving the fact that you have this coupled second order pair of equations, uh, which gives you this, the desired estimates. Okay, so notable differences in the computation from the killer setting. So like I mentioned, torsion terms will arise now whenever you're commuting commuter derivatives or trying to commute indices of the curvature tensor, et cetera, in many instances. Um, and then of course, also when you do, there are many steps in the proof that require integration by parts. And so if you do integration by parts, this red term here would ordinarily vanish in the killer setting. Integration by parts is very nice in the killer setting, but now since we don't have closeness of the metric, the single D of omega to the n minus one is not assumed to vanish, even with our assumption that's right. There's only a single D here. And so we have to handle these extra torsion terms that arise. Okay. So do I have eight minutes left or how much of this proof do I? One second. You, you have it, I'd say at least 10 minutes. Yeah, we started a little bit late, so. Okay, sounds good. At least 10. Cool, so I can dive into the proof methods for these estimates. So step one of showing the estimates is like I mentioned, the C0 estimates on F and phi, where F is log of this volume form. And here we have the CSEK equation. And so this first component is proving the C0 estimate. So to do that, firstly, we the normalized phi so that it's super zero, just to set it to be unique. Um, and then we normalize omega such that its volume is one. For simplicity. And from there, so we're working in the non-killer setting. So the non-killer setting, there's an analog of the Yao, of Yao's theorem for complex manifolds, which is proved by Tosadi and Wine Cove, which states that for every smooth real valued function G on X, there exists a unique B and a unique smooth real fu valued function Psi on X, satis sorry, solving that this complex monoton pair equation. So that Omega plus dd bar psi to the n is equal to e to the g plus b for this constant b uh, times omega to the n, where you uh, ensure that this resultant thing is still Kähler, or sorry, not Kähler, is still a metric, it's still positive. Um, and then you assume that the soup of psi is zero just for normalization purposes. And so ordinarily you can't deduce much about b, but in the case where you impose the assumption that we've been using this whole time, the constant b, in the solution of this comp of this complex mountain pair equation, in fact, has to equal this specific ratio. So in the case where you have this assumption, we know explicitly that B is gonna be log of this ratio. And that's an important part of the proof since now we can tell how, what the dependence on G is gonna be. So our G will be roughly speaking RF. Okay. So using the previous theorem, we're gonna let G be F times log of this thing that approximates the absolute value of F. Um, and we're gonna let Psi be the unique function solving this thing. So we're gonna you know, use that theorem to, to show existence of the Psi solving that complex monoton pair equation where we've chosen our G very specifically. Yep. Now we're gonna use Tian's alpha invariant. So Tian's alpha invariant is a well-known thing that Tian proved in the case of killer metrics and killer manifolds, but in fact, very straightforwardly uh, extends to the non-killer setting. And it states that if you have X omega, a complex manifold, then there exists a constant alpha positive and C positive 
depending only on x omega, such that for all PSH functions on x omega, the integral over x of e to the negative alpha of psi minus sup uh, integrated against omega to the n is bounded. So this alpha and this c are fixed across all PSH function psi that satisfy that it's, yeah, that are PSH. So this is a pretty useful and strong statement. And so by the above theorem, we can choose that tn alpha invariant alpha so that for phi and for psi, these integrals are both bounded. So we've normalized them, so their soups are zero. So this part vanishes. So the statement basically just says that these two integrals are zero, as long as we're working with the tan alpha variant alpha. OK, and now a bit more complex is just like you will choose a very specific quantity to, to apply the maximum principle to. And then you will choose a very specific cutoff function. And then from there, you, will, you have a bunch of uh, constants to be de determined, um, which we'll choose strategically. And, and I guess, yeah, here you just compute. And this part is not super technical. It's, it's very computational, but it's not super difficult. And so the crux of it is that you apply the ABP maximum principle to this quantity Q multiplied against this cutoff function eta. And so the ABP maximum principle tells you that the soup of Q eta over the any given ball is going to be bounded by its value on the boundary plus this large this large integral, where the integral you're integrating only on the part where this, this parentheses thing is negative. And that's just the statement of the ABP maximum principle. And since we know that this, the square root of F squared plus one is always positive, this is why we didn't just choose F, we chose this approximation of absolute value of F. Um, and this is basically an in, the entropy quantity. We find that this right-hand side large integral over the negative part over all of B is in fact can be bounded above by B intersecting, you know, space where F is less than equal to C for some constant C, just by the fact that this is only positive when F is bounded above by some fixed constant C. And then working from there, you can, you know, unravel these definitions out using the fact that F is bounded, and then use the fact that you chose your constants nicely, giving you a resultant thing that looks like the tan alpha invariant bound. And from that, you get that this right-hand side is bounded. And so we know that, yeah, so in one step, we know that size is always negative, so that goes away. So that's why we are left with this right-hand side. OK, and so this tells us that we assume that P was a maximum point for Q, a point at which Q attains a maximum. And so Q of P, which is equal to the soup of Q on the whole manifold X, can then be bounded in this way, where this arose from the fact that we chose our cutoff function specifically. Um, and basically, given what we showed earlier, this implies that we have an upper bound on the quantity, which was in the exponent previously, which is F plus epsilon psi minus lambda phi. And so to prove an upper bound for F, we simply have to bound phi and psi. And phi and psi can be bounded using uniform estimates of the complex Mangin-Pair equation for Hermitian metrics proved by Dinev and Kalijic, as well as Blotsky, um, generalizing from the Killer case, um, which immediately gives us that phi and psi are uniformly bounded. So this then, once we have bounds on phi and psi, then we know that F is gonna be bounded above. And then a lower bound for F follows straightforwardly from a from an elementary maximum principle argument. Um, and the dependence on the, on the entropy arose from, from this large integral that we dealt with to get the, in the process of using the ABP maximum principle. And so it get, gets passed along. Okay, so the next part is the C1 estimate on phi. So here we consider the quantity Q, which is this large kind of disgusting thing, where I want to note that this differs from the quantity used by Chen Chang. So in the previous proof, we effectively had to use non-killer analogs of several key ingredients that Chen Chang used in the killer setting. Um, here, there's not so much existing theory needed. It's more just straight up computation. And so we have to actually adjust our quantity Q here from the killer setting by a simple addition of this plus one, which gives us you know, one more of these exponents. 
So in the Kähler setting, there isn't a plus one here and it works out beautifully, but because in our case, we have the presence of torsion terms, adding this extra exponential of all these little things is sufficient to then have the rest of the computation carry out. So that's the only notable difference. Um, so of course, when you compute, like I mentioned, we have presence of torsion terms, which I will highlight here as these red terms. Um, and so you can simplify this, getting these other two additional torsion terms when you complete a square. Um, and then it turns out in this case of the C1 estimate that these torsion terms are pretty harmless and you can Young's inequality slash cauchy schwartz them away into terms that start to look the same as the other terms arising in the Kähler setting. So you can bundle them all together, just like in the Kähler setting. Uh, obviously where the, the constants are gonna be a little different, but the essential parts are the same. And so if you choose lambda sufficiently large, then we can get that this little portion of Q for the giant quantity Q, then below by this large right-hand side, um, which simplifies using this elementary, using an elementary consequence. So the fact that F was defined this way to give us this, this part. And so you know that at a maximum of Q, the little portion of Q is me less than or equal to zero. And so what we computed here was this inequality. And so from here, we know that at a maximum, if you move this to the left-hand side, the, the power of the quantity that we're interested in is higher on this side with this extra one over N versus on the other side. And so from that, we can deduce or conclude um, an upper bound on D phi squared with respect to omega. So that gives us the C1 bound. Okay, so now we'll talk about the LP estimate. So again, we consider this quantity Q, which differs from the Kähler quantity by addition of this plus one. So it seems like in these two cases, having a little bit of this extra exp exponential with these special coefficients chosen a certain way um, is sufficient for dealing with the torsion terms that arise. And so you compute in very similar manner. And voila, again, we have some red terms, i.e. the torsion terms arising. Um, also a good trick that we use frequently is just completing the square. So you can make these torsion terms look like a different set of torsion terms. Um, and then the new set of torsion terms that we get, again, using Young's inequality slash cauchy schwartz we bounded below by something of this form, which looks more similar to existing terms in the Kähler computation. Um, and so if you choose lambda, so there are always constants TBD, then following a very similar uh, computation as the one used by Chen Chang, we can conclude, we can, we, we can compute that the fact, the fact that the Laplacian of this quantity Q that we're interested in to the, to the power of 2P plus one is bounded below by these other things, which after an integration, this gives us something slightly more interesting. Um, okay, so firstly, it's not yet interesting, but you'll see it soon. Uh, along the way, you collect this torsion term, but that is actually not so harmful and you can bound it by this. Um, and then you, after some cleaning up and bounding things and applying the arithmetic geometric mean inequality, you, you get to this place where you find that the L, the 2P plus one plus one over N minus one norm of this trace is bounded above by simply the 2P plus one norm of the trace. So this is great because the power here is higher than the power here. And so we can iterate to get a LP bound as long as we can show a base case for the iteration. And so the base case we choose is simply when P equals zero. So we wanna make sure that, you know, it's bounded for some, for P equals zero so that we can conclude a bound for all higher P. And so for P equals zero, this right-hand side still holds true. So it's bounded above by simply the trace. And then when you simply compute this trace, it's just gonna be equal to N plus Laplacian of phi. And Lapla an integral of a Laplacian always vanishes by our assumption. So all we're left with is basically some volume term. So there you have an upper bound on the base case, which then gives us um, the LP bound for all higher P, where the constant will increase as you increase P. Okay, and then finally, we wanna show the L infinity bound on this trace. This is probably the most involved computation of the four steps. So here we consider this quantity um, where A of F is now 
a not yet chosen real valid function, and B and N are natural numbers to be determined. So in the Kähler setting, they just had B equals zero and N equals one, and A of F was just, I think, something very simple, like, yeah, which I'll get into in the next slide. So when you compute the Laplacian of the first part of that term, you get a bunch of torsion terms. Um, but you also get some potentially good terms. So this, this term, this nabla tilde, nabla tilde bar f squared term is actually a very good term because you know, it's positive as long as this coefficient is positive. And you can see that in here, this is going to be a second order f term. And so you need to control that using this term. Additionally, over here, this is a potentially good term as long as this coefficient is positive. Um, and this term is a first order f term, which will be used to kill you know, or to account for these two things arising. Um, and so to control these non killer terms, we have to choose our real value function A of F so that, you know, the coefficient here is something positive. So I have the flexibility of requiring that's at least a half. It doesn't, it can be anything positive and that's fine because you can Young's inequality it. It'll just be some infinitesimally small positive amount. Um, and then you also want to ensure that this coefficient is simultaneously positive. So here, I just want to require that it's equal to some positive epsilon. And so now we have to solve this, ser this series of you know, ordinary differential inequalities where you want to just choose your function A to satisfy these two things. And so it can be seen that if you just choose A prime to be kappa e to the f plus half minus epsilon, then you have that it's derivative A prime prime, where it's just a function of f. It's just going to be kappa e to the f. And so if you choose kappa and epsilon, sufficiently small, then in fact, you can have that these two inequalities be simultaneously satisfied. And so that's kind of the one limiting place that was a little bit tricky to deal with. Yeah, so in the killer case, the function a was just f over two. So a prime was just a half. And because they didn't have these red terms, they didn't have to worry about positivity of these two guys because they had nothing that they had to, there's nothing nasty that they had to deal with in addition to just the standard terms. Okay, so now you notice that Q is a sum of two different components. It has this first order F component and it also has a power of the trace component. And that's because each term, one compute, when you compute its Laplacian will give you a good term and a bad term and the other will have like a complementary good term slash bad term. So then it's a balancing act between the, the right ratios of these two such that when you add them together, the resultant Laplacian will have nice cancellations in the terms that you don't know how to deal with. So firstly, if you take the Laplacian of the trace, you get this purple term, which is offset, this is a bad term, is offset by this good term arising from the Laplacian of that first order F term. But the first order F term has this, it's also just a yeah, third order term basically in phi that will then be accounted for by a term that arises in the Laplacian of the trace. So this is a very standard, trick used when you generalize things from non-killer geometry to killer, sorry, from killer geometry to non-killer -killer geometry, where you just balance, you choose your quantities very specifically, and you want to balance it so that the, the, the terms that aren't easily controlled can be canceled out in such a way that you're only left with the terms that you do know how to control. And so we also use a nice observation that Laplacian of a high, fun, high power of a function of the trace can be bound below by the high power of the function of the trace uh, times the Laplacian of just the trace. And that's nice because that means that in some cases we need the high power, but uh, fundamentally the good term bad term ratio stay the same in how it comes out in the trace, sorry, in the Laplacian. Okay, and so from this we get that if you compute out Laplacian of Q, which was you know computed as where Q is defined as this thing inside the parentheses, then the resultant thing after much computation gives you that's bound below by negative this power of trace times the first order F term and then subtract like this other trace term to higher power. We have a lower bound on the trace. And so you can, always, you can play with this and just rewrite it in terms of Q for some possibly much bigger C. And so then you can prove the L infinity bound using mode iteration and applying several instances of the holder and solve of inequalities with, again, we have to specify the base case. So the base case here for Q is that you wanna make sure that the integral of Q vanishes 
sorry, not, not vanishes, is bounded. So firstly, we integrate this L1, sorry, this first order F term. You can use integration by parts because F, you know, you're doing it to two same functions F. So in fact, this term is still equal to this term as you'd see in the killer case. And then this can be expanded. So F is itself bounded and then Laplacian of F can be expanded into these two terms, which can then be bounded. And of course the trace term, so this was the first part of the Q quantity. The second part of the Q quantity space case is bounded by our LP bound that we showed in the previous section. So this is bounded by some C that depends on B plus one, um, which is fine. And then, and of course the entropy dependence is passed along from the first step. Okay, and so that concludes the exhausting list of computations needed for showing the estimates. Um, from here, open problems that are natural extensions of things I've discussed are the most important would be defining and specifying a continuity path to show openness for the, the existence of this constant transcalar curvature metric. So far, these estimates give us closeness, um, but I haven't specified any path, and this would be an interesting problem to work on uh, since our overarching goal is proving existence of the constant scalar curvature metric. Another would be understanding a geometric interpretation of this bounded entropy quantity. So like in the Kähler case, they've made sense of it in, from a geometric point of view. Here, it'd be interesting to work with what we know in the non-Kähler setting or extending theory to the non-Kähler setting to better understand what this entropy quantity means. Um, another thing would be to maybe see if something along the lines of like a Futaki invariant type of quantity or slash invariant exists that would provide us with an obstruction to existence of a constant turn scalar curvature metric. And then finally, it would also be nice to see if this parabolic approach to showing existence works out, in which case we would need to figure out ways of generalizing this turn clobby flow or really uh, some related flow to a broader class of complex manifolds. Okay, and that's everything. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the nice summary, making these very, very difficult computations friendlier, friendlier for us. Are there any questions from the audience? I already asked some before the talk. Go ahead if there's anything. It's, it's difficult for me to point people out. So go ahead and unmute your microphone and ask if there's anything. If nothing, I did have one additional question perhaps. So when mm -hmm. I was tracing the steps in the also important C0 estimates, I could not find uh, where, anywhere where you use this uh, vanishing del del bar conditions. So oh, I used it when I uh, when I when I used the Tassati Weinkov result for the complex Monchamp pair equation, the Hermitian manifolds case. I uh, used it to to know what the constant B is. So that constant B basically gives you something that looks like the entropy. So you know that the dependence on the resultant constants will depend on this this entropy mm -hmm. quantity. Like we didn't assume the DD bar of the mega vanishes for those two for those powers, then the constant B could be some exotic thing involving F, but in a way that we don't fully understand. And since we're trying to bound the C0 norm of F, we want to know what we're bounding it by as a function of F. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in this case, we know that it's going to be bounded by this entropy quantity. But yeah, in other cases, it might be bounded by, I don't know, other exotic integrals involving F. That's something that I think would be interesting to see, like if the dependence on the, the constant dependence on F can be more clearly stated in the Tassati wine cope result so that we can still conclude some sort of estimate there. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you for clearing that up. And there was one more thing on your very last slide. If you go back, I had a, sort of a flash. So, so towards the second line, so understanding geometric interpretation of bounded entropy. So at least mm -hmm. from a very biased point of view, in the Kähler world, the, the, the first thing that one thinks of when you say bounded uh, entropy, you think of compactness with respect to this L1 Mabuchi type metric. So sure. yeah. the, the question is, so perhaps you know, for that, you'd need to have some geometry on this space of that's your admissible functions. And perhaps, as we discussed, that's a little bit out of reach. But mm -hmm. even beyond that, so historically, this D1 topology was preceded by a more potential theoretic point of view in this, you, know, you might know of these BB, EGZ, BBGZ papers, mm -hmm. where they introduced this. Uh, so first of all, 
if, if there's a, I mean, it, it looks like to me that you could have this kind of pluripotential theoretic approach. If, if, if you could set up this E1 space, this kind mm -hmm. of finite energy integrability, perhaps, perhaps it would be possible to discuss compactness there even without uh, these, this infinite dimensional geometries. Historically, that's uh, what, what happened. So somehow this L1 mm -hmm. Mabushi came much later. I see. Yeah, that would be interesting. I guess I haven't dug deeply to the to the starting points of the what happened there in the Kähler setting. And I've most course, recently somehow geometric yeah. integration, at least in my mind, it's sort of synonymous with you know compactness and, and finite energy to mm -hmm. That's true. That would be interesting since my work currently on trying to understand the geodesics in the space of permission mm -hmm. potentials hasn't hasn't really led to anything yet. So I might need a different view approach. So this could potentially sort of circumvent that. And historically uh, sort of the, the, this geometric in, infinite dimensional approach came much later. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay, that's a good note. I'll look into it. And also, oops, you say, you mentioned this Futaki type invariant. Mm -hmm. you, you're sort of looking into if you have something like that. If if it would be if if such a thing existed that mm -hmm. really resemble Futaki invariant, my impression is that in that would indicate that you have this kind of uh, uh, invariance by holomorphic uh, self maps of your manifolds of your CSA mm -hmm. metrics. So, so that's that that might be an indicator. If you have that, then you might it might be worth looking into this Futaki situation. If not, it's a mm -hmm. little. Uh, I would be a little bit pessimistic, but of course, I could be wrong. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so far the whole thing with trying to find something analogous to the talk invariant is challenging for this for the same reason that most of this extension is challenging. Mm -hmm. um, because you want invariance under addition of DD bar of a smooth function. Um, right. But then all of your integration by parts becomes doesn't quite work out nicely anymore. Yeah. All right. Well, if no other questions came up, did, did somebody think of a question? If not, then we'll thank CC again for again, the very nice talk. Thanks a lot. We, we invite you for to a vin virtual dinner, <laughs> whatever that may be. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll definitely stop the recording.